This book. This book, y'all. It was wild. It was a wild read, I'm not gonna lie to you. Was it completely terrible? Well, not exactly. Was it worth the hype? Since we know that this book has a Bram Stoker Award, one of Richard Lehman's last books, and arguably very popular, voted up there as one of the best horror books out there. In fact, on Goodreads, I'm pretty sure it's in the top 100 best horror books list out of like 1900 books. Yeah, it's fucking cap. <laughs> oh man, y'all. <sighs> so I read my very first Richard Lehman book. And I did so because there's a lot of hype behind Richard Lehman. He's a very popular author. A lot of my friends are fans of him. Shout out to Michael Goosebumps fan, also known as Strange Michael, aka Night Living Dude. He's a huge fan of Richard Lehman. I know Shady Side Library reads a lot of Richard Lehman. And I know Richard Lehman is a popular guy. You know, he writes horror. I heard his stories have really wild and insane ideas. They're often crazy, balls to the wall. And he's known for being a splatterpunk and extreme horror writer. So by hearing that, I thought, you know what? That's interesting. Because of that, I want to read one of his books. And then I saw The Traveling Vampire Show was one of his last books. And his only book, I believe, to get a Bram Stoker Award. And for those of you who don't know Bram Stoker, he's the author of Dracula. And this award is made in his honor and given out to the best books that they elect. And I was like, you know what? This is probably going to be a good start. Uh, I know Monster Blood, my friend, uh, did end up reading this as his last Richard Lehman book. I think his fifth book or something. And he ended up dropping Richard Lehman. So I had two opposite sides of the coin to kind of combat against. And of course, when I read a book, I make my own opinion. I read it as if I block out everything and I just try to see the story for how I feel about it. And this book, <laughs> do I think that it's worth the Bram Stoker Award? No, in fact, I might have to revoke that award and I might have to give it my own award that I feel is more fitting, which is the Axe Body Spray Award. Now, for those of you who don't know the Axe Body Spray Award, I give out to any book or story that I feel is overrated, not as good as people say it is. And although it's not the worst thing I've read or not terrible, more so average to kind of meh or bad, people hype it up. And that's what kind of makes you more kind of angry towards it or more disappointed sometimes. In this case, it's on both. Uh, so yeah. Axe Body Spray Award. Now this book initially did attract me obviously because of the title and the premise. And let's just go over the premise of the book right now for those of you who have not read it. Richard Lehman's The Traveling Vampire Show is about these three teenagers in the 1960s in a rural town called Granville. And this group of teenagers is called uh, Slim, Rusty, and I believe it's Dwight. Dwight, Rusty, and Slim. Dwight is the main character. You follow his perspective throughout the story. Rusty is this kind of uh, more kind of reckless friend. And like he's more so kind of dumb, kind of goofy, that kind of guy in your friend group. More reckless, more sort of strange. But you keep him around because you've been friends for a long time. And he's a good guy at heart. You know, he really cares about his two friends. And then you have Slim. And Slim is sort of the only, she's the only girl in their group. And, you know, Dwight is actually very attracted to her. He's actually pretty much in love with her. Um, but he can't confess his feelings because throughout the book, you know, or it describes that they've been friends for a long time. So he's basically stuck in the friend zone. Uh, but he feels like he wants to get with Slim and he's trying to enjoy his uh, summer right now. However, what ends up happening is that there ends up being this news that there's going to be this uh, kind of show called the Cirque, uh, the Traveling Vampire Show, kind of like a circus freak show attraction that claims that this show has the only vampire ever in captivity. And I think her name is Valeria or Valeria. I'm gonna call her Valeria because it sounds dope or it sounds more dope. But yeah, Valeria said to be a descendant of Dracula. She's this very beautiful, very luscious, very alluring female vampire. It's said that any man that lays eyes on her basically gets super seducted and attracted to her, similar to Sirens and the Femme Fatale and Succubus kind of stories, that kind of thing. And the show is claimed to be 
for adults only, everybody above 18, and that you're gonna see Valeria basically get to unleash her behavior and attack the crowd and make a big show for everybody. And this attracts the teenagers, they're very excited. However, they're too young to get into the show, so they have to recruit some help, maybe some family members who can take them there. And they decide, you know what, we're gonna go to this traveling vampire show no matter what. However, they decide to go to Jank's Field, which is this place out in the middle of the woods where this old arena used to be. And this old arena got taken down at one point because like I think a bunch of violence and like sexual assault and a bunch of crazy stuff broke out one night and just shut it down. It was a bad place. And now it's just left with broken beer bottles, drug needles, you know, snakes and different dangerous things and stray dogs. So it's dangerous to go out there. Nobody really goes out there. But they want to go there and check it out. Maybe they think that they can get a glimpse of the captive vampire Valeria. And they don't know yet if it's actually true or not, whether it is actually a vampire, whether it's a play, whether they're just kind of hyping and staging it up, but they make a bet. Rusty says, you know what? She is a vampire and she's probably going to be the most gorgeous woman we ever laid eyes on. So that's my bet. If you lose Dwight, I'm going to shave your head. You know, Dwight's like, I don't believe you. There's no way it's a real vampire. Slim is kind of like that too. And when they head there, they get confronted by some stray dogs. It's a very dangerous area. And the what ends up happening is that Dwight, because of a situation, has to go back to his house um, and get his brother's wife, um, Lee, and basically get her help um, to basically assist him in getting to the Traveling Vampire Show. Um, and when that happens and he goes back, Slim and Rusty are missing. And because of that, he basically ends up um, trying to find them. They get this weird encounter with the crew of the Traveling Vampire Show. Um, there's a guy named Stryker and his crew that they all wear like black t-shirts and black leather pants and very emo, very kind of, you know, depressive, but they all seem like a bunch of weirdos and right away they get red flags and then Slim describes something that she saw the traveling vampire show crew basically do that may or may not involve animal abuse, some strange ritual killing, and allegedly they dropped a dead body into the a coffin that was being carried in a hearse and right away they realize you know what this may be more than we can deal with it's too dangerous and then as they get back home uh, they think that they may have been followed and maybe they walked into a mess that they cannot get out of and that's essentially the plot now this story premise was really fun really interesting and I did like it I, I love circus horror I love vampire horror combining those two that it sounded like the perfect package to me. It sounded like this was going to be a super fun story, super creative. It could have been, you know, I, I knew it was going to be sleazy. I knew it was going to be like that. Um, so that wasn't that big of a problem. But, you know, there's some stories out there like The Circus from Tales from the Dark Side, I believe. Season three, I'm not sure. But it's a circus that involves a vampire, the circus, and other monsters. Really interesting, really fun story that I loved a lot. I thought this was going to be like that. And no, no, it wasn't. My huge negatives with this book is that I'm, I swear to fucking God, y'all, nothing happens in this book for 80% of the story. 75 to 80% of the story, nothing is happening. The traveling vampire show you actually get to finally go to in the last 20% of the book. And this book is, I think, 390 something pages, almost 400 pages of a book. And only like the last shit, 80, 70 pages is like you actually going over to the vampire show and actually getting some final action and crazy shit going on. The rest of the story, the rest of the 75, 80% of it is just teen drama. These kids doing these very mundane tasks. You have a lot of of sexual tension between the teenagers. It's all about them being horny, them trying to get in each other's pants, even amongst the friend group. And you have some absurd sexual writing in here that's like, it's it's so absurd that you just have to laugh. Like it was so badly written that I was just laughing out loud. Like I knew this book was gonna be sleazy, but it adds nothing to the plot. And it's just a bunch of, it's just a bunch of padding that just eats up the plot. You don't actually get to the good stuff until the very end. It involved like, what is it? Fucking, f f fucking, yes, exactly. F fucking, that's what this book, that's what the book is about. Fucking, uh, no. Basically, 
like the the opening to this book starts off with Dwight mowing the lawn because you know he has to do some chores and Rusty and Slim come up to him you know to greet him and Rusty says what up and then Richard Lehman writes a line like even though he said what up you know I knew that that was meant to be a sexual innuendo huh excuse me what what up means sexual innuendo excuse me did I just read that bro what do you mean saying what's up means a sexual innuendo? So right away, it's like this absurd level of horniness amongst the teenagers. And then Slim, the girl in the group, you get a paragraph about her backstory. I swear to God, y'all, her backstory is the most disgusting thing I ever read in my life. Not even, it's, it's, it's the most, it's the worst shit I ever read. Not just, not writing wise, but the what happened to her in her past involving her dad, Jimmy, Oh my God, that was the most disgusting, disturbing thing I ever read in my life. Sexual crimes and pedophilia and stuff like that, man. And it's and it's worse than I make it out to, make it out to sound to be. Trust me, it's worse than what you can imagine. I'm not gonna talk about it because that's not its place. But very disgusting, very disturbing. And her two friends know about it. Dwight and Rusty know about it. And then they'll make these crude, absurd statements like. Like, they'll be, like, thinking about, like, watching Slim take a bath or, like, or, like, rubbing the, the, the soap that she uses on her body, like, up against their face. And then they'll make some joke, like, oh, yeah, she knows about sex. I mean, we know what happened with her and Jimmy. That's your best friend? That's what you say about your best friend? Your best friend went through the most disturbing crimes known to man and may or may not have involved potentially killing that person who was torturing and ruining their lives and again you get hints throughout the story the stuff that happened in her past is disgusting which doesn't add to the plot just thrown in there just because why not and they just make these absurd statements like oh yeah she knows about sex you know because she dealt with her dad and then it'll be like she'll even say it she'll be like you know what don't worry guys i, I know what you're i know what's on your mind trust me jimmy taught me all about it Ugh, dude, that's nasty. And just the whole plot is full of just those every single paragraph. It's just sexual. Every paragraph, you guys, is these teenagers being horny. Horny as fuck. It is the most unrealistic fan fiction level writing involving them being horny. It'll just be every single paragraph. Even if the plot involves something creepy, like somebody potentially breaking into your house and stalking you, just randomly the next paragraph, it'll be, I saw Slim's bra lying on the dresser and I suddenly had an intrusive thought to grab it and rub it up and sniff it all against my face. I'm like, dude, why is this in every paragraph? I mean, I get intrusive thoughts are a thing, but this is restricting the writing. It's adding padding. There's like three, four chapters about you know, Slim and Dwight making hamburgers and just like being horny over each other while making the burgers and drinking beer. If that's not padding to not get to the goddamn fucking point of the story, I don't know what is, man. Get to the fucking point. All right. All right, dude. I swear to God. Why is only 20% of the story involving the actual traveling vampire show when it's in the title of the book? You're getting basically clickbait. This is a similar thing to like if you read You Can't Scare Me from Goosebumps. You see the mud monsters and you think that there's going to be mud monsters. No, there's not. But that's just a cover. This is in the title too. Oh, and speaking of Goosebumps, 60% into the book, you have all these like slightly creepy things that happen throughout the book involving somebody potentially stalking the kids, um, invading their homes, doing some, some creepy eerie things around um, their lives. And 60% into the book, you get a Night of the Living Dummy 1 slash Night of the Living Dummy 3 type of retcon twist. 60% into the book. Now, you may not know what that means, but if you've read Night of the Living Dummy 1 and 3, you know what the retcon twist means. The retcon twist means that all the events that you thought were attributed to a certain something are completely recontextualized to being done by a different character. And unlike Night Living Dummy 1 and 3, which had main characters involved in the retcon twist, this one 
involves an insignificant character. A character that has no real fucking purpose to the story. So it's actually even worse than Night Living Dummy 1's retcon twist. And this is in an adult horror book with the Bram Stoker Award by a famous author. So maybe this isn't the best book to start with, Layman. You know, I admitted maybe I should have read The Woods After Dark, or what, The Woods Are Dark, Woods After Dark, whatever that one's called. I plan on reading The Cellar. Uh, you know, I heard that one of his best books is Endless Night, and Monstrella told me he the one that he liked the most is Dark Mountain. Honestly, maybe those ones are going to be better. Maybe those have more action, a crazier plot. This one is clickbait. A lot of it is super boring, super meandering, a just day in the life of some horny teens for 80% of the book. And then the, the, the climax of the story, let's talk about the climax. The climax of the story is good. It's good. It's wild. It's crazy. I liked it. That last 20% is wild. I enjoyed it. You get a lot of action. You get a lot of violent stuff. You get a real fun, sleazy, like that, that aspect of fun, sleazy slashers is in that climax. And it, it, the ending is disturbing. It's creepy. And the twist ending leaves on a bittersweet note and kind of ends it off like an urban legend that ties to the reader. So that part I liked. But again, you have all this fluff before it. And also, a, there's a scene involving like a, 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 a some somebody or something being killed and it's done by this unknown force and apparently at the end of the book they reveal that you know they explain the villains of the book and then they explain that they don't know what killed this thing you know under a car like the so it was this extra villain that could have been cool that could have been some like I don't know, snake or worm or, or some, some type of creature that apparently killed something under a car. You have no idea what it is. It's not explained at all. It's like a complete mystery. And I was like, you added that. If you, if you took more time to flesh out that villain in the story, you could have had some better creature feature and extra stuff added to enhance the story. You don't get it. So what's my recommendation? Honestly, Layman should have made this into a 70 to 80 page novella. Just focus on the climax. The climax of setting up the characters, getting to the eventual vampire show, and just keep the rest of it. And it would have been a fun, cool, interesting novella that you could have read. But instead, you made it a full-length book, and it just worsens the score by quite a bit because a lot of it is nothing happening. So, and, and excuse coughing and everything. I'm, uh, the people in my house don't like this book that much either. Uh, but... What would I give this book out of 10? I'd give it a 5.5 out of 10 only because the climax is so wild and good. And because the climax is so wild and good, that's why I enjoyed it more than I should have. But without that climax, oh boy, this would have gotten like a 2 out of 10. <laughs> so the climax is a lot of action. It's fun. It's crazy. So that justifies it getting, to me, a 5.5 because at least that part you're going to enjoy but man, this is a wasted opportunity, wasted potential. And yeah, Layman, this book, the first book by you, not off to a good start. You're getting the Axe Body Spray Award. That's all I have for today. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, that's the end of this video. Again, if you liked it, please hit that subscribe button down below and hit that like button. I rebranded my channel to the Horror Tavern. No longer BD Horror because I realized that I'm making a lot of different genres of horror as content. So I just wanted to be a nice place where people can stop by and enjoy horror, have a good time, have a good laugh. And I think the name the Horror Tavern matches that really well. Um, I have more adult horror books coming up. I have kids horror, YA horror reviews on here. And of course, more on my schedule uh, coming up for reviews and yeah let me know down below what are your favorite Richard Lehman books is this one one that you've read do you agree with me disagree with me and what are your recommendations for any Lehman reads uh, and that's all I have for today hope you guys enjoyed and deuces sorry for anybody offended by this review but I'm convinced that anybody who did were the few people who were busting a nut to this book while reading it and uh, yeah make sure to unstick those pages